Everybody, first meet him. Well, welcome. Nice uh, full room. Um, welcome to my talk. It's about event sourcing. Well, it would be awesome if it still picked it up. We'll do it manually. Um, who of you have actually worked with event sourcing already? It's quite a few. In production all or just playing? Just a few production. I keep trying if it works. Nope. Yeah, 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 yeah. What? <laughs> oh, happy. Um, so we're we'll talking about event sourcing. Um, if I go too fast, just let me know. Um, it's hard to, to make a cut where I assume people know everything and I need to explain it. So if I go too fast, please let me know. Uh, at first, I will uh, dive into our domain uh, domain a little bit, uh, just to explain um, the kind of application we're building, and that you uh, can hopefully easier follow what's uh, what we're trying to achieve here. We are building a job marketing platform, which is um, a, sorry, a nice term that I didn't hear before before we started building it, uh, but we sell job sites to, to companies. So they have an opening and they want to find the, the, uh, the, the best people for the job. We try to help them, help them with that. And we help them by choosing the best channels for that job. So channels, uh, for example, are really confusing. <laughs> uh, Monster Boards, Indeed, LinkedIn, Stack Overflow, um, GitHub, for example, that's that kind of um, channels. It can also be Facebook ads, so it's really everything in a, in a bit. And if you come into the system, and we are changing this, but at this moment you first have to create a campaign, um, and that's just so we can help you uh, actually f um, find a channel. So we give you a recommendation based on the criteria you give here. So the job title we actually use to, to, in, uh, to get some information from, but mainly also the yeah, region, uh, the industry you're working in, stuff like that. After that we do give you a recommendation um, the recommendation uh, is a completely separate system, so it's an external recommendation. And if you do not do not like it, you can customize the recommendation, so you can add some channels, remove some channels, whatever you want. So why would you do event sourcing? Um, there are a lot of reasons why you could do it. Uh, I think you're throwing away data, which sounds like a good reason to at least hear to what I have to say. And you throw away data be, be because you're in a lot of applications, you only store the current, the last known state, the current state. So you don't know the previous state anymore. You don't know what has, what has changed lately. Uh, and you also don't know why something changed. And event sourcing isn't usable for all applications. Uh, you don't want to just blindly start using event sourcing but especially if the changes you are making to your data are they're kind of important, and especially when you start implementing versioning everywhere, for example, you might want to give this a thought. Yes. Uh, so how does event sourcing help with this? Well, we are actually going to change the way you store data. So instead of just updating a row in your database, we are going to store the actual change you made. That event uh, that we're going to use for that um, describes what happened, but more important, it also describes why something happened, which is, which can be very important depending on what field you're working in. Uh, it can be very important to to see later on in your system why a certain change was done. And if we take all those events, um, the multiple events we have created. If you stack them on top of each other, in the end, that will result in your in your new state again. And these events also allow you to go back in time. So time travel is, is possible, which is pretty nice. Yes. Um, another thing uh, which is a nice benefit of using event sourcing, in, in my opinion at least, is that it can really help you uh, understand your flow in your application. It, it forces you to think more about why you were doing stuff in, instead of just altering some data in a table somewhere. Uh, one example that, that we use, why, how we use event sourcing, which helps us really good, 
is discarding the customizations. So people who created a campaign, added some of those channels, and then we have a button to go back to the recommendation we gave them. How would you do something like that in CRUD, for example? Well, it's, it's just an example, but a thing you could do is you uh, could start keeping keep track of the original recommendation. How you do it, it it's, of course, uh, on to debate, but you could, for example, uh, just keep track in, an, in, in the table of your campaign with um, an, a Boolean if it was part of the recommendation, yes or no. And then if you want to revert, you just uh, throw away the channels that weren't part of the campaign, of the recommendation, sorry. But how about the already removed channels? Well, you could implement the soft delete. Um, so you have to keep track of the soft of when something was deleted or if it was deleted and if it was part of the recomm original recommendation, um, which seems to work fine. But keep in mind you can o you could only do that for uh, newly created campaigns. If you have a system running for a while already, um, then implementing this is fine for new campaigns, but old campaigns still uh, wouldn't have that information, which might also mean that in the rest of your application, you have to um, yeah, account for that situation, that it can either be reverted or it cannot be reverted, or it can cause complex logic in your application. So, how do we do it with event sourcing? Well, we're just going to rewind. Um, we just go back to the, look back to all the events that have occurred. So, an example uh, of the, the feature I described, the, the discarding of the customizations. We have multiple events in the system. The first is the campaign created for a target group. Um, the target group is for the rest of the story not really relevant, but it does show that we really describe in the event uh, why the campaign was created. Um, one of the things we're working on at the moment, for example, is that you can also create a campaign um, without a target group by just browsing or a complete portfolio of channels. But that's where we started. Then we have some events for removing, adding channels. And then we have the event customization discarded. Um, and I'm going to show later on how we actually get to that event. But mainly, we just go back to the first event and stop, yeah, stop looking there for, for what came, came after it. We know that's the initial recommendation. That's part of that event. So how do we do that? Um, we do that with a little bit of help of CQRS and domain-driven design. How many of you have worked with domain-driven design? Which is a bit more common, I think. Yeah, awesome. And CQRS? Yeah, a bit less. Usually, usually the case. Um, in my opinion, um, domain-driven design is a, an event sourcing go, go hand in hand. Uh, in theory, you can do event sourcing uh, on its own, but it's, it's, I think it makes it really powerful that you just include your business in it, in the event, instead of just having an event, I updated some model somewhere. Real, so in my examples, I'm also going to use Broadway, which is a PHP uh, library we open sourced that helps with domain-driven design and event sourcing. Um, and I'll also dive a little bit in the code of Broadway itself to see how event sourcing actually could work on the water. So creating a new, new campaign, how would we do that? Um, because we also use CQRS, we, we uh, use commands to trigger actions in our application. So that's the first one on top, is create a campaign for target group. Again, uh, we use quite a lot of text to actually make sure that it's clear for also new developers, for example, uh, to know what we're, what we're going to do. That campaign is handled by our, uh, the command is handled by our campaign aggregate root. Um, the aggregate root is responsible for keeping the, the state consistent of the campaign. Um, one example that we got there is that we that you cannot add channels for ordered campaigns, for example. The campaign then will uh, record the event, campaign created for target group, and we store that in the event store. A lot of text, but uh, the main important part here, um, I will highlight them. A minor thing is that we create the ID upfront, 
um, just a thing that you see also when you go into asynchronous, asynchronous programming. Um, you're not going to rely on the database to provide a new increment ID. You generate it up front and can return it to the client yeah, almost instantly. And after that, we see that we're actually going to dispatch the command itself. Um, for this example, it's not really important what's in this command, but it's everything you need to, to actually come to the event later on. Uh, so here we see the target group again that's described in the event. Next is the command handler. Um, the command handler is, in our case, a difference per implementation as far as I've seen, but uh, responsible for getting the extra information needed um, to actually perform an action. So the command handler knows, say there is something that needs to be done, an action. I know that we need this extra information. And then the command handler will actually make sure the campaign gets called in this case. So our first step is to actually um, create the campaign object. Um, we use uh, static constructors for this, um, just because if you would use new campaign, nobody would see what we're actually trying to do. So again, we are very, very explicit with we create them for a target group. And after that, we save the, um, the campaign um, in a, with the repository, which is actually um, retrieving the events that happened and store those in the event store. But we'll see that later on. So the campaign itself, um, this is the, the static function I just mentioned. At first, we actually have to create the instance. I mean, we're still programming, we still have to make the object. So there, that's where we start with, and we go to record the event that has happened. At this point, um, your application is sure that this is, this is valid. Uh, all validation should have been done before this. Um, so the event is an actual fact that happened, it's done. Uh, you see a little line here uh, in front of it, it's just our implementation, that's where we retrieve the, the recommendation for this specific campaign with this target group. But let's dive into uh, this apply function we have here, here a little bit. Um, this is part of Broadway itself. This is uh, an abstraction in the uh, event source aggregate root abstract class. Um, but the first thing you'll see is that we're going to handle the events that, that we're recording uh, recursively. Um, this is part domain driven design again. But what, what, we, what, you, what you might have noticed is that when we recorded the events, we didn't actually change the campaign itself yet. Um, so the action was performed, but nothing actually changed. So when we record the event, we first tell to the campaign itself to apply this. Uh, so that's the handle function. And this is the function that will eventually be called. Uh, so you see apply here again, and we use the default implementation in Broadway at least is convention based. So it will use the event name to actually search for a method name. But in your own implementation, you can do whatever you like, write a mapping or, or something else. But here you see that the event we get um, is actually updating the state of the campaign only at that moment. So back to the, the event source aggregate root. And here we see that we have something called a playhead that we increase. And uh, this is really important to make sure the order of events is correct. You have to guarantee in your application that if you have multiple events, that you know at what point in, yeah, in the timeline it exists. If for example, you have uh, the campaign created again, uh, campaign created event, and then you have uh, two events that almost happen at the same time, one of them is going to error because yeah we expected to have the you know the se the second or zero index base of the fir uh, number one we expect so the event source is actually going to guarantee for you that yeah, wait I expected one and I actually get another one uh, this which is wrong or if you screw up in another way if the event source get a two and it didn't receive ever one it will discard that uh, also. After that we're going to create what we call domain message. Uh, the main message is a wrapper of, uh, around your event. Um, it has some properties like uh, the aggregate root ID, which is the, just the unique ID that we just created in controller.
um, the playheads that we just incremented, so we know which playhead <coughs> this uh, event itself has. Uh, metadata, in this case empty, uh, you can enrich it later on. We use metadata, for example, to track events throughout the system. So uh, we give it the request ID, we give it the IP of the user. Um, we have a system to, to impersonate users, for example, our support uh, department does that. So we log into the metadata, who is impersonating at the moment, stuff like that. Um, important to know is that <coughs> the metadata you store should not be part of your domain. So your, your business uh, should not suffer if the metadata is lost, as long as the event data is still available. When we have that domain message, we're just we are just storing it in an internal array, um, pretty straightforward array. So we now have the, um, the event is created by the campaign. Um, we have it somewhere in the array, now what? Or we're going to save it in the campaign repository. And again, this is a part of Broadway, the saving uh, part. Um, because of PHP, we first have to check uh, if the type you're trying to save is the type you actually expected. Generics would be awesome, but no. Um, and after that, we're actually going to uh, retrieve the events from the aggregate root. So this is the uncommitted events, uh, events that, has, that, that is not stored yet. And we're going to append it to the event store. Uh, the appending part is really important again, because all your events, the, your event store is append only. You can only add stuff to it. You cannot a week later go back and uh, inject some other event in between because, oh, that should have happened as well. Yeah, you didn't make it happen, so bad luck, it didn't happen. Um, yeah. After it's saved, so after we have the guarantee that it's actually succeeded, uh, the event store didn't throw any exceptions or whatever, we're going to publish the event on the event bus. Um, that allows the rest of your application to yeah, act on the event, to, to do whatever it needs to do. Like I mentioned, if you record an event, you at that point should know for sure that it actually happened. You shouldn't be going, well, it probably happened unless this case happened. No, it, it happened, so deal with it. And the event only. So we now have this flow. We have seen this from commands to the event store. But yeah, we want to interact with the campaign again, so how would we load something like this? Well, just the other way around. From the event store, we get the events and we're going to recreate the campaign. Again, this is abstracted by Broadway, um, but at the first thing you will do is actually, you have an ID of the campaign because your user has a URL or whatever, it has the ID. Based on that campaign ID, we're going to load all the events part of that, that specific campaign. So that's what, what we do here. We get um, a list back from all the domain messages, so with the timestamp uh, as well, for example, and the metadata, everything. And based on that, uh, on the, the event stream, we're going to re um, reconstruct the campaign. We use an aggregate factory here. Um, because of reasons uh, like the named constructor we use. The first version of Broadway, we just had a uh, new class, as in, yeah, you have a public constructor, we just assume that. We changed that to uh, actually allow to use name, named constructors. But after the aggregate factory created the class, it will actually call this method, which is part of the interface, um, where you initialize the state of the campaign again. So it will receive the domain, uh, the all the domain events and loops over them and actually calls the same function again to yeah, handle that event, to, to apply that event to the campaign. And you have to make sure that you yeah, correct your playhead again, because new events should still um, yeah, reliable be appended to your event store. So the playhead should always be in sync again. So we now have a campaign, we know how to load it. Let's add a channel to it. Well, the flow is uh, similar again. We have commands, campaign, an event, and event store. I'll jump directly to the uh, command handler in this case. So we see that we load the campaign from the repository, which is what we saw just now. 
this, this will actually return the campaign instance itself, so not the event stream, but the repository will return the campaign itself. And then we can call the method add channel to perform the action we actually want to happen. Um, you might notice that we pass an extra yeah, service in here. Um, not really relevant for the example, but it will show that you can inject stuff to the actions um, to, to calculate stuff which is hard to do otherwise, which you don't want to do in the class itself. You want to uh, let some other thing specialized for that. Uh, so you can inject it like this as well, instead of only with dependency injection in your constructor. And again, after that, you will save it. Uh, the add channel method itself. Um, this is the, the, point, the thing I told earlier. The campaign is fully responsible for um, keeping his state consistent. So it will guard if the campaign is not ordered, if it was already ordered, if it will throw an exception, and you have to deal with that error. I'm not sure we have the nice errors that we just discussed in the talk before, <laughs> but that's a different story. Um, and after that, again, we go to record the campaign, and again, make sure that the event, the record event, sorry, make sure that the event contains all the information you need to, um, to make sure your state is correct. So in our case, for example, we pass in the complete campaign price again, not the specific channel price we added, but the complete campaign price, because for our domain it's important that we know what the campaign price at that moment was when people added the channel. And this is the apply function within the campaign, um, the, the, so the handle recursive uh, function. And we'll see that we the channel we just add to an internal array. Uh, when you're used to um, to working with an ORM and with entities, um, that sometimes get really complicated. You, you have to create the joints and all the, the joint tables, stuff like that. But here it's really simple, it's just an internal array, which makes working with the object really, really nice. And we also mark it as customized, which, um, which we need for discarding the customization later on. Okay, so we have a campaign, we added the channel to it, or we did some other modifications, but how do we get a listing of all the campaigns, for example? Um, it might get really annoying if you don't know all the IDs to go to the event store, try to get all the unique campaigns, and then load all that campaigns. It is doable, it's probably even pretty efficient uh, in a small set of data, um, but here's where we are going to use CQRS to um, make it perform a lot better because we're going to create a read model. And a read model is a specific repres representation of, um, of one of your use cases. So for example, so you're not only going to store it in the event store, but you're also going to store it in a s click, in a separate read model store, or even if you wish, multiple read model stores, <laughs> uh, specific for what you need. So. We don't have that uh, example at the moment, but you could, for example, see that uh, some raw data you could sto uh, store in MySQL or Elasticsearch to search or whatever. But if, if you have a lot of counters or other data where Redis fits in a lot better, you can also store it in Redis. And it, you don't even notice that a lot in your application anymore, which is pretty nice. And we are going to create the um, read model uh, by what we showed earlier, the, the event bus. So we store the event, and then we're going to publish it on the bus. And then we uh, have a projector which listens to that event. Um, a projector, uh, yeah, is what it sounds like. It just receives some data, projects it on the way it, it, it's suited for him. Um, so in this example, I have the campaign overview projector to have the listing of, of your current campaigns. And we just, based on the event we get here, and the domain message for um, the date time, the timestamp that the event occurred, but we use the events to create a very simplified read model of a campaign. Um, if you saw in, the, in all the events, we had a lot more data than, than this. The only thing we're actually using is campaign ID, company ID, and a job title. The rest we don't need in this read model, so we're not going to project it to our st uh, read model store. Nope, the ones work. Okay. 
Wow. Sorry. Uh, another projector we have is the Campaign Details Projector. This projector uh, has a lot more information uh, because this is the read model we use when you're actually modifying your campaign. So here we uh, saw everything we need to uh, inform the end user uh, how his campaign is doing and, and what's in it. So we do store all the channels, for example, and we do store the target group here. So we can also um, use the history to our advantage. Um, we can do this for the example. No, it's, it's fine. Uh, I'll show you the example of the discard customization. So we, I showed earlier that we keep track of the initial recommendation of the, on the initial event, the campaign created. Uh, and when we have the, um, the command discard customization, we get into the, our campaign. Then we'll see that, we, that it's really simple to actually revert that, that customization. Because we have the internal state of the, our campaign, we just have to create a new event with yeah, the state we, we keep track of here. Um, if it should have been an array or not, small detail, but that, that's another question. But it, yeah, it shows that it can be really easy um, to, to use the history to your, to your advantage. And again, you'll see we just update the state based on this event. So now we have the basic flow of the application so far. I want to go into the testing a bit, how you would test this. Are there any questions so far? Is everything a bit clear? sure that um, it's consistent like can you do, you do you wait for that or do you just assume that they are in some inconsistent state and once you lose it will be in the same state it largely depends on what you need what you want to do uh, but generally generally you have to assume that your read models are eventually consistent so you it's it's PHP, so it's usually it's completely synchronous. So if you don't get an error before return to the user, you can pretty much guarantee that actually uh, the read model has been updated. But if you're going to do it asynchronously, for example, then you definitely have to work that out that that uh, your read models may not have been updated yet. But there are a lot of ways around that. You can, for example, um, if something happens in your system, you add a channel or whatever. You you just gave a command at this channel. So you're 90% sure that if you get an okay response uh, back, that that channel has been added. So you can already inform the end user a little bit what happened. You can inform him that it's maybe not completely ready, but I'm pretty sure it will be this. It totally depends on what, um, how accurate your, your front end needs to be. Well, first of all, if you are going to change your events, you have to be really, really careful. Um, but what I think 90% of the case, if you want to change an event, probably means that something changed in the way your program is behaving. So in a lot of cases, you probably should create a new event because it has a new intent, for example, or it's a new reason why it happens. So it's a completely new event. But it's definitely a good point because you once an event is stored in your event store, you have to deal with it. You have to support it either way. And I already mentioned in the beginning, we are changing this flow at the moment. So the um, campaign create for target group, we are not going to use anymore in probably a month or something, but we still have to support it for the rest of the application. There are ways around it. Um, there, if you actually need to adjust um, an event, there are um, things called upcasting, for example, but we haven't implemented it yet. But uh, the basic <coughs> idea is that before actually giving the event back to an aggregate or, or whatever, that you can transform it in small steps to a new state. But if you don't have the data in your first, in your original event, you won't get it in the, in the events after that. So it's, yeah, it's 
really important when you do event sourcing to model your application really good upfront. Um, so I'm not sure how many of you know Matthias Verras, it's a Belgium mainly PHP uh, um, a guy, but he gives courses in, in model storming how you would approach something like that. And it's something I really encourage to everybody to do if you start doing event sourcing, really get your team and all the stakeholders together and try to come up with the events that should happen in your, uh, in your application and uh, build around that. Any other sh 10 minutes? Any other quick question before I continue? No? So testing, we are going to use uh, scenario testing. Um, if you are in PHP, you probably uh, have heard of BHAT, but other languages has, have similar tools. Um, but it's the Gherkin language, uh, which, you, which you can use for scenario testing. Um, but the idea is that you have a given, then, a given when then um, uh, scenario. So given some events have happened, uh, when I actually issue a command, or when an action happens, then I expect the following events to have been recorded uh, because of that action. So for example, we have the campaign creative target group. When we have the command add channel to campaign, then I expect channel edit to campaign to have been fired, to have been recorded, sorry. So a small example how that could look like in PHP. Um, we pass an array with events, because yeah, you can have multiple events uh, that you need for this action to have happened. After that, you issue the command itself, and then you test if the recorded events since um, since uh, yeah since emitting the um, the action, since emitting the command, dispatching the command, those events should have happened. How do you know the timing? What do you mean? Because we, um, it, in this scenario test on the water, how we do this is that we have an in-memory event store, and as soon as uh, we call the when, we yeah, start recording new events that happened, and we just get that array. And as I said before, the order of the array, is the order of the events is really important. So we can also here guarantee that I first accept, uh, ex expect the channel edit to campaign event, and then some other event like. In theory, we could have a campaign price uh, a changed event or something. And in this test, you can also <coughs> really guarantee the order of the events that came out. Is that clear? So this is the, um, an alternative route how you could do it. Instead of passing a command, uh, you can also have the when uh, use callback. So you can directly communicate with your aggregate route itself. Um, we choose to not do this, um, although the um, testing from commands to events is definitely not a unit test anymore because it, yeah, it involves uh, multiple steps. If you want to do it on a campaign directly, you still would have to um, unit test your command handler as well, which duplicates a lot of the work you have to do. So yeah, we just like the approach from command to event a lot better than to directly communicate to the, to the aggregate route. And when you want to test your read model projections, you can do something similar. You just, uh, given some events have happened, when this event happens, then I expect the read model to be in this specific state, which can be quite nice to, to again, really clearly see the flow of your, uh, of your state and how it should happen. And your event stream is also really powerful to, uh, because you can use it to correct mistakes. If you actually have a mistake in your event, you're pretty much screwed. So you really have to think about it. But if you have an, an error in your read model, you can just drop your read model, recreate your read model, which is quite nice. But you can also create a brand new read model um, based on the previous events, which is really powerful with reporting, for example. If you uh, came to the idea that you want to um, yeah, to measure a new thing in your application, you can just replay all the events to, to come up with yeah, an, an, a new report uh, based on data you might have recorded for the last 10 years already. So that's really powerful. 
but it's also very tricky. Um, one example is um, your event store uh, puts, you have the event store, you put your events on event bus and you have your read model search to listen to it, but you might also have an email processor that sends emails that listens to the same event bus. So when you're replaying, you don't want to use your event bus of your uh, regular application uh, unless you want to spam your entire customer base again, which might be nice, but probably not. Um, uh, not with us, no. <laughs> probably happened somewhere. Uh, no, but with replaying, you really have to um, be very careful, and which is probably the case for almost everything, is really look at the problem you're trying to solve with replaying. And, um, find a solution for that. <coughs> because it, it might make a lot more sense to just write a separate command line application really short that gets a few events that you need and creates uh, a do specific tasks that you need at the moment, instead of trying to uh, get all your events from your, from your events store and fix everything at the same time. Um, so really, really take a close look at how you want to do that. That was the, the basic for the questions. You get your uh, current state by replaying every event. Uh, <coughs> might it be that that can take longer and longer to press? Of the yeah. Um, it really depends again on the application you're building, uh, because you only get events for a specific instance of an aggregate yeah. route. Yeah. So if you don't have a lot of mutations, it won't get slow. Yeah. If you have a lot of mutation mutations on a specific instance, then it could get slow. Um, but there are solutions for that. Uh, one is snapshotting. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, 1,500 events, you're just going to create a snapshot every, I don't know, 500,000 events, but you can also do it every hour or every day, is just what you need in your application. And when you start to replay, start with the latest snapshot and only um, use the events after the snapshot to build your state again. So, I know that there's a lot of uh, added complexity to get this event code to work. Yes. Um, not that often. We're currently working on an issue to replay something, um, but there we have the luxury that we can, uh, we, we are replaying our events from the external system, which does a lot of reporting for us. Uh, and we have the luxury that we can just create a new uh, project in that external application and just replay everything. So we don't really have to think of edge cases or anything. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's for each replay, you have to really consider uh, how you do it and how often you do it. But I have heard people that just have it automated, that actually do a replay every every day or every week or whatever. And especially when you do a lot of reporting, for example, you will have some sort of way to replay events uh, every week or whatever. I had to mention oh, uh, this is the first <laughs> uh, this is the first um, uh, it's a new start of the symphony user group again it has been silent for uh, I think almost a year now maybe even longer I'm not sure um, and the next meetup is the December 10th again um, probably here in Utrecht but there's no location yet so if you have a uh, company that wants to sponsor a location get in touch uh, meetup sites over there please join us <laughs> <laughs>